Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I will be your reader today. The Unexplored. The Unexplored. Recently, a former business associate, now retired and living modestly on the island of Hydra, off the south shore of the Peloponnesian Peninsula of Greece, said slowly, contemplatively, and almost in awe, so much to explore and so little time. Well, as we both know, one does not need to travel that far, nor even leave home at all to come to that conclusion. Most often, I personally find that sentiment appearing on my radar screen when daydreaming about the life that was. Or when standing in awe on the top of one of Edna St. Vincent Millay's three long mountains of Camden and wondering about all that exists beyond the sea that I can see in the distance. As a high school geography geek, I vividly recall spinning the globe in my bedroom and stopping it abruptly with the tip of my finger saying, think of everything I could have explored there. <laughs> now, that's what first comes to my mind when I think of the unexplored. But of course, the word implies to every experience that has never, or at least not yet, cross our path. It remains unexplored. So many aspects of relationships go unexplored until real happiness or real unhappiness unfolds. At the bottom line, there are innumerable experiences we explore or choose to leave unexplored in our day-to-day -day lives on our path of life, beyond the seaside nightlife in Hydra. But surely one experience which we all share in common is the most difficult to explore. As a matter of fact, I would think that most people choose to leave it unexplored. And the rest of us, the more curious, the ones who wonder more and prepare for as much as possible, only reluctantly approach, approach it, that of our own mortality. For some reason, we just don't want to talk about it or even think about it much. I'll wait till that day comes. Speaking about the experience of dying is seemingly almost taboo in our Western culture, surely more so than in nearly all Eastern cultures. When the inevitable end comes closer, what will I experience? What will I explore? Well, of course, the answer is different for each person on their own path even though at least a slight bit of curiosity remains for all of us, however unspoken. Today's book in the spotlight focuses on mortality and on what matters most on that final leg of the journey from what we know into what we don't know. Bedside Matters by novelist and abstract artist Richard Alther explores the possibility of our inner life taking on a new shape as our body continues to betray us. In a cinematic, non-linear way, Alther examines through Walter the promise of life, even at its end, something that concerns all of us at one time or another. But 
Before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. I start with a quote. Fiction has meant for me to wander and eavesdrop, not to espouse a point of view, to peel endless layers of the onion in pursuit of discovery, wisdom, tolerance of diversity, compassion. Richard Arthur was born and raised in suburban New Jersey and graduated from studies in English at Cornell University. As a natural entrepreneur and businessman, he was drawn to the heartbeat of Manhattan, where he thrived during his 20s as a promising, then successful young executive. Before the start of his third decade, however, Arthur spread his wings and headed for wider open spaces to nurture his even broader talents and dreams. Quote, I'm glad I left Manhattan in my 20s and moved to Vermont, where there was well-bow room to become a generalist. It was easier to start a business to support my family, as well as to indulge my passions for writing, artwork, sports, and gardening, plus have quality time with my wife and daughter. I'm a lucky man, end quote. With fresh air and an inspiring expanse of the natural world embracing him, Richard Arthur came truly alive in a myriad of energized and energizing ways. Steps from Lake Champlain as a more than adequate Olympic-sized swimming pool, Arthur grasped onto his first ever athletic endeavor, devoting himself to a rigid training program and eventually competing nationally as a master swimmer for several years, reaching the top 10 at age 50. His business acumen resulted in the success of a business he launched and nurtured so much to success that it deserved a team of 300 employees. Of his simultaneous career as an abstract artist, he has said, whatever watercolors or oils in art galleries from London to Vermont to California, my landscapes and waterscapes are barely defined, very impressionistic, which I came to realize was a way to express my worldview before writing fiction. It's a view that places healing, calming, restorative contemplation about the flack of modern life. But, it is the success of his career as an, a writer that brings us to our spotlight today. From the earliest phases of his career, writing extensively about Vermont vegetable gardening and homesteading, to a regular writing assignment with the Huffington Post, Richard Arthur has in the last decade realized yet another goal with the publishing of five novels, including his most recent book, Bedside Matters launched last year in 2021. <clears throat> Again, a quote, writing has allowed me to delve ever more deeply into the basic mystery of life. What makes us tick? As a novelist, I can ask questions and not necessarily seek answers. Becoming a novelist has, quote, made me more accepting and forgiving of others whose ideas are contrary to mine. Anti-Semitism, homophobia, sexism, ageism. As a writer, I have wanted to explore the roots of such adversarial, persistent forces that divide us instead of unite us. Richard Arthur now divides his time between homes in Palm Springs, California, and on the shores of Lake Champlain with his grandchildren. 
He is always alert to latch on to a new inspiration for the next stage of his successful multi-layered life. Bedside Matters, a novel. What matters most? Tough question to answer as we move slowly toward the end of our short life on planet Earth. Recently asked in an interview which writers had influenced him in the writing of Bedside Matters, Richard Arthur recalled, since earliest days of reading certain serious novelists, Updike, Malamud, Bellow, Roth, I too have been compelled by our mortality, which we do our best to ignore in this culture. It was a challenge to confront this head on. My fictional version is but one of many, mind over matter. Clinical psychologist Bart McGee is the founder and executive director for, of Access Institute for Psychological Services in San Francisco. After reading today's book, he assured readers that, quote, more than a story of a man coming to terms with his life in its final chapter, Richard Alther's Bedside Matters provides meaningful insights to anyone interested in the process of letting go. Letting go must be a very hard thing to do. Former governor of Vermont, Madeline M. Cunin, outstanding author of the book, Coming of Age, My Journey to the 80s, adds, Bedside Matters is such a rich and articulate example of how truths fall into place toward the end of our life. Richard Alter has written with sensitive insights into the mystery of death. And finally, Alter admits, I wanted to see if my protagonist, Walter, exposed in his last year to the blunt realities of others, could be capable of acquiring compassion, the bedrock, I believe, of spiritual well-being. In my humble opinion, Richard Alther's fifth book, Bedside Matters, is at least a roadmap, a pencil, on paper bag roadmap of what lies ahead for those of us blessed with the time to contemplate and to prepare. Alpha has no answers, but the man surely took my curiosity up a notch and jolted me even momentarily, maybe permanently, out of the day-to-day oftentimes mundane, sometimes joyous world I wake up to each morning, forgetting an end is nigh, eventually, and always sooner than later. Bedside Matters by Richard Alther. I'm going to begin at the beginning, actually. Sometimes, as you know, I do a bit of skipping around, but I think the first uh, few chapters set the stage so brilliantly uh, that we're going to begin with chapter one, actually. And the character Walter is very fond of reading uh, the writings of Rumi, who, as you know, is an ancient poet from the heartland of Turkey and some wonderful sayings. And there's one to start each chapter. The first one, as the saying goes, the pot drips what is in it. Must think about that one a bit, hey? <laughs> so let us begin with chapter one of Bedside Matters by Richard Alford. You're just dying, Walter. Irma, his caretaker, has said, 
We all do. A poor boy who made good, now flat on his back and slack as a beanbag. Walter does not feel sorry for himself. Luck of the draw, his disease. But he does not apologize for his full cast of mind. That has not changed, nor will it likely. I was prickly way before this business, he acknowledges. And if ever I've earned my right to grouse, how else could I have ended up with my widget empire if not for pushing, shoving, plotting, nothing ever good enough, needled by my cantankerous hell-bent ambition? Irma is looming over his bed, shrinking his newfound picayune place in the universe all the more. How goes it today, Walter? To him, she's Gulliver, as seen by the tiny people. Hungarian by birth, broad-shouldered, her big bones overwhelming any trace of tenderness, which of course is there. She's a caretaker. She runs the household of which she has become, as far as he's concerned, a bit player. The spare tire, an afterthought, considering the beehive of activity that propels his estate. She moves about the bed, fussing here and there with ballerina grace despite her girth. Walter both worships and demonizes Irma, upon whom he is now totally dependent. I used to be in charge, Irma. This is the hardest part. I know, Walter, the mighty hath fallen. But look, now you get to drink in all the beauty of your splendid home and surroundings, forced to sit still and count your blessings. Here, take this pink pill. He swallows. I I'm not complaining. I'm just stating the reality because it's still difficult for me to believe. There's just so much amusement staring out that window. I'm goddamn sick and tired of Goma Pyle reruns. Try Andy Griffith, she flattens her apron. On a svelte woman, it could pass for a drindle, but not on Irma. All right, Jackie Gleason, more sophisticated. She pinches his exposed big toe and cracks a smile. Seriously, they're all these books Paula has brought. Another thing, he hurls to the side. Would you please have the pats of butter, room temperature? How can I spread them when they're like bricks? Pathetic. It's reduced to this. A command about butter, hard or soft. Well, damn it, I'm still the boss, albeit of a handful instead of hundreds. Irma waltzes about. Stretching wide the curtains astride the large picture window, refilling his water glass, straightening the sheets. She's ignored the snippet about butter. He fixes her with his gaze. He was a slight man to begin with, mostly bald, about as undistinguished as is possible for an early-ish elder. Irma rests her wide bottom at the base of the bed, to Walter, more like a souped-up lazy boy rocker with all the bells and whistles. Emphatically not a hospital device. Not yet. She can tell he has more to say, apart from their initial joust of the day. Smooth, large hands now folded in her lap. I'm fine with dying, Irma. It's just like to know when. She gently shakes her head not to the point of whipping about the thick blonde braid that forever strikes Walter like a military guard with a rifle strapped to his back. Softly, she says, it could be months, years. My whole life has been a schedule. Up at dawn, desk at 7.45 before the troops traipse in, home at seven, listen to the wife, listen to the kids, you mean you sat there stone-faced like now in one ear and out the other? 
It was family time. Be curious what Polly would have to say. Oh, his caretaker is sounding as smug as his ex-wife at her battle readiness. He slumps and stares off. Oh, I admit, guilty of my age, my generation. I'm the breadwinner, bushwhacked by the time I get home. All hell breaking loose there. I'm about to add to the mayhem, the shouting match, of course, the silence, the kids, and Polly seething. Best to shut up, I always thought. He takes a slug of water, sick of water too, the incessant intake of which Irma enforces, bad as an enema. I realize this is misery for you, Walter, an itch like you with me in charge. Thank you for that. Instantly, he regrets the phrase. You've got a hold of God, finally. She stands, apparently deciding enough of such an exchange, her upper hand reconfirmed, thus needling him all the more. God, hell no. I haven't gotten that far in the affair. Walter misses Polly, handful that she was. She crashes the party whenever it suits her, no matter her present fog. She's a shortcut to his past, which he cannot black out and so must tolerate her insistent electric breath into his still surging bellows. He let her dominate center stage, and yet much as he tries to replay the merriment their early years, Walter can be swamped by the pain of losing her. It's as if his mind keeps touching a live wire when he's supposed to be in repose. In some benign sense, he reflects, he's already lost his mind, given the recent regimen of drugs. Oh, Walt, do shut up, she would say. I'll be in charge of this business, too, between us, she pronounced, even before they were married. You just keep that pointed Puritan nose to the grindstone and raking it in. She didn't really say that, but that's how it seems to me their marriage meshed when it did. Without intending, his mind blessedly taking a break, Walter is gazing dreamily out the window, hoping that hummingbird would come buzzing out of nowhere and insert its beak into the tiniest nodule of the blooming lilac. How the hell do they do that? But this conjecture fritters away, as do all others, leading him a blank slate for whatever mental assault or visual distraction might next dash across his muddled playing field. Sometimes things come and go in a desultory fashion, like seagulls weaving slow circles in search of a cast-off fish. Other times, it's like the 50-yard dash. If the drug stupor is momentarily lifted from its smothering layers. Jolted back to the moment, he can picture, as they predict in a month or a year, not being able to move his toes, lift his head, command his bladder, Despite some shaking, the hands are fully functional for now. Adjustable bed at his disposal. The checkbooks, credit cards, laptop, cell phone, right by his side, as if nothing has changed. I can drive. And not to the office, but for the heck of it. I can walk wherever. I'm just in bed all day because I've become lazy. Not immobile and frustrated as hell. There's a commotion in the kitchen. Walter is installed in the former dining room adjacent. Footsteps from Irma, just as she likes it. A young girl holding something squirming comes abruptly through the door. Irma at her side with a devilish grin. Walter, you have a visitor. Well, two. It's June a high schooler with something special. Beaming, the girl comes to Walter's bedside and places the wriggling, fuzzy, golden puppy on his lap. He sits upright, 
horrified, a boring pets. What they, but cuts himself off. I'm from the shut-in squad, young June announces proudly, still holding the puppy, but gradually releasing it into Walter's chest. Walter strains to thrust his back into the elevated bed, forcing himself to touch the eager creature, the petting drawing upon his very last straw for a tad of civility. The agony lasts a god-awful 10 minutes. Walter attempting not to shudder. Did it pee? The puppy's slick drool coating the back of his hand. Emma makes small talk with June, compensating for the sourpuss. June gets distracted by Irma's earth-motherly warmth. The puppy suddenly charges up Walter's chest with him practically prone in retreat at this point and slobbers his neck, cheek, reaches his lower lip. All right, croons Irma. This has been delightful for us. June, you're a doll to do this, isn't she, Walter? And Irma escorts the guests out. She promptly returns to the master of the house. Walter can tell his face is aflame, probably crimson. She gets right to the point. Well, what about a cat? No, damn it, no cat. It wouldn't cuddle. They're aloof, just quiet company. I don't need company. What do you call me dallying with you all day? You're more effort than the kitchen. I could just cook and deal with the staff. You could not, I mean, rest peacefully by yourself. Walter laughs, you got me there, just like Polly. What would I have done without her running the show? Like you, now. Stop abdicating to the foxy bitches. Being prone, you can still be a foil. Irma goes to fix his lunch, leaving him to his own bedeviled thoughts. He closes his eyes, the better to bring closure at least to the shut-in squad. He is shoveling the sidewalk. The snow is impossibly heavy and wet from an early spring storm. He struggles with all his 10-year-old might, taking a full scoop, defying his aching limbs, eager to finish Mrs. Rustling's, collect his dollar, and get on to Aunt K Auntie Cable, the widow lady who presses two whole dollars into his hand each time. He thinks Auntie Cable might be crying with utter pleasure, squeezing his hand best she can, being severely crippled. His own aunt said the elderly soul has runny eyes, not tears, but still he's thrilled by her generosity. Auntie, uh, not his real aunt who's raising him, is a fixture in the high-end neighborhood several blocks from his own home. She reeks to Walter of a violet perfume that almost stinks. She has shoulder pads of doilies pinned in place with diamonds and sapphire brooches. He knows she is wealthy, the biggest house on the street, but that doesn't mean she would pay him double. He knows he brings joy into her parlor, darkened and deadened by huge, heavy drapes. She is a true shut-in. After church every Sunday, he delivers to her that week's bulletin from the service. Who were the ushers, the title of the sermon, who gave the flowers. But he understands deep down he is courting her because she is rich. She will not let Walter leave. Him, practically pacing in place to get to Hubschmitz, his next customer. Without Auntie foisting upon him a large bottle of Hire's root beer, she knows his favorite. If he drinks at all, she could chatter on, adjust her beautiful curls of silver hair piled atop her gently shaking, palsied head, smile and come alive as if she was a young girl again. She vibrates with palpable cheer like a roly-poly Santa. But by the time he finishes his soda, Answers her questions about his school, she avoiding discussing his father, 
stuffs his pocket from the candy dish she has thrust at him. He is reluctant to leave. He hates to disappoint her, to see her cheeks overly pink with rouge abruptly collapse into their usual folds, layer upon layer. An abandoned rag doll, gone limp. But he forgets her the minute he gets to his next job. Walter is startled by the brush of a lilac branch against the picture window. Must have dozed off. Someday soon he will have to roll off and pee into an elevated chamber pot. <clears throat> so he's been told. For now, he can shuffle to the bathroom night and day. He suppresses an incipient urge to relieve himself and lies still. This state has become almost bearable. Walter muses after the sturm and drang of his life. He should appreciate his final resting place. What will he ever know of a grave, ashes, memorial service, or a wake? <laughs> this is it. All the stuff of my life, Walter thinks, has been crammed into one of those Cuisinots and pulsed into puree. I'm blended in. No more me. No more strange silence with those kids. No more attempting to make sense of surly Paula and sour Gavin mumbling incoherently if I did speak up. Even after Polly was gone, she, the family CEO, no quibbles there, she had a way of presiding in abstentia. As visitors, Paula and Gavin, long since adults on their own, plus others come and go. I wish there were so with all my lingering confounded judgments, disgust over Gavin, bossy invective from Paula. Why can't all that just go up in smoke? Irma squats on the armrest of the big upholstered chair while Walter sucks at his beef broth with limp noodles. He pauses. All these blasted memories, Irma, like I'm facing a fire squad. The family, not to worry, Walter, with so much time on your hands. Go on, give them hell, at least in your own mind. Get it out of your system, you'll feel better. Regurgitating all the crap, who needs it? You do, trust me, you do, he nods. Once again, the lady knows best. Walter became an orphan, sort of, when he was six. His mother and older sister, his only sibling, were killed in a car crash, breezing through a red light. A flask was on the seat between them, the back seat littered with bottles and beer cans, easier for her. Walter figures in retrospect, then dealing with their flat already crammed to the hilt with junk. His father supposedly worked on construction crews, but spent every night at some casino. Horses. Walter was told by his aunt, who was really a foster parent. There was no regular family for him like the kids at school. But Aunt Peg had more than her share of work dealing with three foster babies. She was paid for doing this. And four druggy teenagers, apparently long before authorities kept a close tab on this stuff. The teens ignored her, so Walter, by nine and ten, found plenty of action at odd jobs after school. Little time or interest in having fun. One thing, though, was the newfangled television, which shut everybody up, enthralled. The ragtag household would gather in front of the four-inch thick plastic bubble rigged over the minuscule screen to enlarge the image to a full foot view. They all howled with tears over deadpan Groucho Marx, outrageous Milton Berle, side-splitting Sid Caesar and Arnegene Coca. But it was dashing icy cool Steve Allen and his luscious wife, Jane Meadows, that
that implanted seeds into the marrow of Walter's grammar school bones. Thanks to the suave Steve Allen's belly laughs aside, there was laid out the serious and beckoning path from which Walter was never to waver. It's been over a year since Walter was told he would have another year, maybe two or three, no way of knowing, like Parkinson's, but not in fact. Like MSA, multiple systems atrophy, but he was not entirely following that course either other than the very gradual and inevitable deterioration of his nerves, muscles, organs. Everything will go but his brain. There is no cure, came the simple statement. He was satisfied with the initial neurologist, but Paula demanded second and third opinions. He gave it his best shot for a while, despite his total lack of interest, doing leg lifts, calf raises, arm curls to stimulate his low blood pressure to maintain a modicum of strength. Bullied by medical types, let alone his daughter, he lacked the gumption to resist. But this is not me, Walter concluded. He never exercised. He did watch what he ate. Seven almonds, he counted them out instead of a fistful. Small portions, he's not a big man, sip his expensive wines, knowing what they cost, never swill. His extensive wine cellar, well, it was primarily an investment. This he relates to. After Polly, there were never any friends in his scene, mostly the wines accumulated, like his money. For ages before it became official, he would drop an iron skillet. At least it missed my foot. Some aches and pains, hell, who doesn't have them at my age? Forgetting if he had already seen that episode of Murder, she wrote. Probably forgettable. Most likely, I'm losing it there. Tripping and falling backward, yet again. He simply did not want to be bothered going to a doctor. And so it went for many a moon, until now, sequestered, quiet, no decisions. No one to bug him except Irma, whom in truth he empowers to be sergeant at arms. Fine with me, thinks Walter, nodding off in mid-afternoon. No pain, no worries, and napping guilt-free. Hello, Walt. Will there? Walter opens his eyes, clouds the color of ash, obscuring his bay window view. Who invited you? Okay. We were equal partners, Will and Walt, until, until you saw otherwise, Will. It wasn't me. It was your drink, your all-consuming divorce, whatever. Let sleeping dogs... I am a sleeping dog, Will, in case you bother to notice. I was the brains of the business. You were the rock. Never your hand left the wheel. Ever presiding at meetings, ready to commence ten minutes prior, terrorized everybody into following suit. I was the co-owner. My turn at the helm. Yes, it was your wild imagination, Will, your ideas for the products in the first place. I made it happen. We each did our thing until, yes, Walt, we all know, I gave Sandra everything to get rid of her. I ran debts up the yin-yang, bought myself a mansion too, squandered whatever was left on the kids, until you were no longer functioning as an equal partner, let alone a major employee. No, Walt, that's your face-saving scenario. I say, until you struck like a stealthy snake and instigated the series of loans, boxing me deeper into debt when the only outcome, the only logical option left for me, logical is your middle name, was for you to buy me out and... 
Let me sail solo and hardly coast, but magnify all the inherent opportunity to capitalize on my brain power, my God-given marketing savvy, the formula that worked will and simply needed elbow room without your bullheaded interference for the enterprise to really flourish and make your killing la di da without so much as a dollar of restitution when you sold. You weren't speaking to me. I offered lip service. You were so drunk and beyond hope at this point. You never touched a drop, Walt, never lost control. Somebody had to be. Well, my dropping dead a few years later felt left you free and clear. Walter leaves a pause. Oh, get out of here, Will. You did your thing, then you threw in the towel. You grabbed the stocks, all those shifty legal shenanigans behind my back. You'd always begged me to handle all those boring details. It's too late. You left me nothing. We were equal partners at the start. It was never in my power to ruin your life. Really? Equal? I came to you with multiple talents. You had one. Dead ringer for a manager. Dime a dozen. Yes, Will, you were the extraordinary salesman, dreamer, infectious personality, mechanical engineer, power play, negotiator, blessed with unbridled energy, womanizer, party boy. I was nothing but a dolt. At least give me credit for that. My latching on to an even keel. The bed linens have been changed. The neat dosage of drugs is at the ready. Who did this? Paula? Is she still here or am I making that up? The dopamine, aptly named, is not working. The latest attempt to restore coordination. They said drugs have never been effective for this, but worth a try. More chemicals at the ready. Don't I already have enough? My bloody switchboard gone berserk. Has Irma wanted to fix lunch, but been hesitant to wake me? Irma forever hovering, damnable much of the time. Walter adjusts to being contained in only one room now. First floor, of course. Formerly the beautiful dining room with its soporific, becalming evergreen walls punctuated by handsome ivory crown moldings and chair rails. Did he pay attention to the Williamsburg inspired layout and filigree of this impeccably crafted neo-colonial as they evolved? Apparently not. The 220 acres, yes, of those he was acutely aware. He took pride briefly, paying cash and acknowledging he was, as is said, officially Lord of the Manor. At this instance, he is entranced by a sudden streak of sunlight igniting a shock of lilac in full bloom. However many shades of purple might there be, violet to inky blue and back again. Is this what painters are all about? When they plunge into their palette, do they have a particular borderline bluish violet in mind? Or is it just a stroke of their genius? Another of the million pokes before and after each particular one. Something he certainly never thought about. The sunshine hides and snaps shut his line of reflection, shifting Walter to the bedside stack of checkbooks. Now, Here's some food for thought. What to make of it all? He has no debt, of course. The will and legal things are long since in order. And yet, and yet, this mountain of cash. With Paula, he damn well better remain sharp as a sword. Walter had aced junior college, working full time in the school cafeteria, and got a full scholarship for his last two years at the State University. He recalls having to work part time in the loud, grubby printing office. He'd never not worked. It was no big deal. 
He almost felt sorry for the preppies and kids from the right side of the tracks. It was as if they didn't have a clue of what makes the world go round. As for making a killing, they were way too nice. Emma hesitates before removing his dinner tray. She closes the curtain, readies the bedstand pitcher with a clean glass. Amazing, Walter considers, Irma practically pirouetting about the spacious room as if she's really happy, as if she's doing a little dance. You're an unusual woman, Irma. All you ever told me is you left Hungary in your late teens and connected with relatives in Wisconsin. You must have so much history before you landed here. I just work for others. That's enough for me. I love to cook. Knowing all you've been through, Walter, I feel a lucky woman. My life is simple. You're a mess. Just tending you here and now is a full-time job. Steady income. I don't have to think about myself. I think I've got it easy. I should reduce your pay. With a straight face, she responds, no longer your business. If anybody, your daughter Paula's my boss. But frankly, it's me who tells her what's going on. The latest from the doctors and nurses. She's put enough on her plate. Her company, divorce, the kids. She keeps wanting to give me a raise as you decline and need more help. I've told her that's not necessary. I already live here in the lap of luxury. I'm sorry you can't seem to enjoy it anymore. She halts. I'm glad you feel that way. I know I can be miserable like a perpetual adolescent. You said it, Walter, not me. Her arms, which have been akimbo, flop now to her sides. End of therapy session. That self-assessment will keep you out of trouble for the time being, mulling that one over. Perpetual adolescent. I get a kick out of you, Walter. I never raised a kid of my own. You're the closest thing. That's good, because I'll never grow up. Have run out of time for that. Emma bustles off. Suddenly, Walter resents these niceties. What about replacing her with a manservant, humorless, perfunctory, Walter considers, one less dominatrix to deal with, given his fragile state. Yes, indeed, Walter, your pockets are bulging today, exclaims the lovely red-headed lady cashier at the local bank, an easy 10-minute bike ride. She is Irish. I like his foster mother, Aunt Peg, but... This woman has the biggest smile, at least when he is next in line. He unearths his latest treasure, two whole wads of bills. I'd have even more, he says, since Auntie Cable and Dr. Altman and Mrs. Haas paid me extra for really coming along. I'd, um, Mrs. Haas paid me an extra for raking the leaves before moving. Boy, oh boy, this account of yours is really coming along, she gushes and winks, exaggerating her dimples. As she does her desk work, Walter is bursting head to toes with that amazing sensation like pins and needles, but as a thrill. He loves the ever-creeping upward total amount, nesting safely in the booklet no one in his house knows anything about. The cashier hands him the booklet with another huge smile. He fits it into the front pocket of his dungarees, roomy those days, before hopping onto his bike. He furiously pedals home even faster than the trip downtown, even though the road back home is all uphill. Chapter two is a tad bit free for us, so let's see if we can fit in part of that. Chapter two, um, and the quotation here is, not by Rumi, by the way, it doesn't say, the loose hair strands of a beautiful woman don't have to be combed. I guess that's the 11th commandment. <laughs> Walter has started to keep track of the indeterminate variety of birds fluttering outside his window. 
Irma gave him a guide to occupy you in a more positive way than grumbling about your kids, who are no longer kids, I have to remind you. He refused the offer of installing a bird feeder. Ruckus, I don't need, he told her, flat out, a rare occasion of his presiding. Normally, it was easier to do what he was told, especially by a bossy woman with whom we, he somehow lacked her language, which left him stumped for a cogent rebuttal. More and more, he gazes stupefied out the window, maybe to avoid her, him in the cell, mute and cowering, determined not to provoke his jailer. He recollects the recent flowering shrubs of spring, lilac, forsythia, even some peonies along the edge. But for the most part, the slice of yard he can view is overly groomed lawn, foundation plants, some larger materials, American high bush cranberry, he thinks if he's not mistaken, which is likely is, addled with meds. All this formal stuff is now a big green blur. Irma suggested planting a summer flower garden that he could see, but Walter emphatically declined and she dropped the subject. Too fussy, he had snapped. He was turned off by the carnival of colors he thought would shout for him to notice when his preference was becoming for everything to be simpler and serene. He remembers the off-putting spiky red salvia once bordering the driveway, favored by Polly. Fire engine red, like her lipstick. Drove him nuts, the salvia, not her lipstick. After she was gone, he told Bruce, the head yardman, he thought the salvia too noisy and had it replaced with the ground cover patsandria, much easier on the eye. Little things like this could be irritants. Unlike at the business, he ran seamless as a fine Swiss watch. At the domestic arts, as he understands them to be called, except for the odd item like getting rid of the screaming salvia, he was deaf and dumb. And now, cast adrift with unpredictable memories, often aggravating as canker sores, he'd rather stare at the gently tumbling clouds, nothing to command an actual focus, as in adjusting binoculars to a razor-sharp line. In fact, his eyes now droop, a harbinger of sleep. How grand! Midday snoozing, like playing hooky as a kid. Of course, given his being the class brown nose, such truancy never crossed his mind. Walter wriggles in his daytime ensemble, sweatpants, sweatshirt, slipper socks. That's a misnomer. Whenever did I sweat? He'd be just as satisfied to stay in pajamas and bathrobe. But he seems, even though he's the patient, this particular agenda item falls under Irma's domain, which implies that a certain decorum must be maintained. Day and night in sleepwear could heighten her watchful but often peevish intrusions. Important to fake his continuing independence, even though he is feeling weaker and less mobile day by day. Gradually, he sits up. If he's too abrupt, his low blood pressure triggers dizziness. Standing, like now, that too must be at a slow motion rate. Damn it, I am not ready for the walker, let alone a cane, Irma's pressed upon me for practice. For when, not if. It will be all too soon. He takes a deep breath, the breather to attempt standing tall. Walk. Walter directs himself. Your exercise for the day, to and from the john, doesn't count. Brushing his teeth? Listen, while the hands are so good, that's something to celebrate. He shuffles around the large room, decides on a stroll into the great room, the parlor, the library. What the heck? Pace the hall while he's at it. Brownie points for Irma to report at least he got out of bed. Look at this house. It's so ridiculous. The fireplace big enough to roast a pig. The dark, imposing woodwork. The high ceilings, cozy as a cathedral. 
It's an ersatz colonial posing a la Williamsburg, but unapologetically a showplace for the nouveau riche. Oh, get me back to my nest flooded with light from the picture window. Can't argue with that as a shot of optimism. And he settles again onto the elevated bed, semi-pleased for his brief spin out and about. So he's not totally dissolute, slouched here 24 seven. Ah, he moans with relief like a bear curled up and hibernating all winter, the rest of his life in his case, sealed off from the madly spinning world Eyes rested along with his ever slower breath, grudgingly thankful for the tranquility he's been granted to collect whatever thoughts, give them their say, and then shove them aside. <laughs> well, we'll end there. Walter is a challenge, certainly. <laughs> Fortunately, Irma has a sense of humor. <laughs> Although we do get to meet everybody else in the family eventually, um, Irma is uh, is quite the character and uh, sort of keeping him going to the very end. Um, uh, so it's a lovely book. Uh, it gets more and more and more into Walter's processing uh, the last phase of the journey, actually, as he's on it. Um, and there's a, a great amount of food for thought, uh, a great amount of uh, very sensitive reading, I think. So I strongly suggest it, uh, Bedside Matters, a novel by Richard Arthur, uh, published in 2021. I hope you'll read it. Let me tell you a little bit about next week's book, if I may. Uh, next week, we are going to uh, read a book as a salute to a very challenging topic, and that is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We're going to go with a book called October Snow by Jenna Brooks. It is the 2012 Reader's Choice Book Award winning. Just to begin the story, a tad to uh, try to lure you in, Josie Kane is a difficult woman, a pure enigma, one who survives her abusive husband by honing her unnerving talent for playing mind games. She knows exactly how to manipulate a bully. Finally divorced, she thinks the abuse is over and she's free. She's wrong and her cynicism is building. As with all subjects related to this issue, it's a bit harrowing of a read, uh, but it is uh, a solid book, very well-written book, um, and uh, very, uh, very, very exceptionally thoughtful. So I hope you'll be with me next week uh, for that book. Thank you so much for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please uh, like it by pressing the thumbs up and consider sharing it with your friends. Also, uh, please feel free to leave a comment, either about the subject matter or the book, or maybe the author, or perhaps your own book, uh, your own favorite book, I should say, or your own book <laughs> that you would like us to consider reading in the coming months. I also encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library's Programs YouTube channel to stay on top of the amazing array of content. I do like to report uh, yet again this week that our Camden Public Library remains uh, strongly in number one place throughout the entire state of Maine, including the bigger cities, uh, with the largest number of subscribers to its YouTube programs channel. So please subscribe and keep us on top. <laughs> It'd appreciate it. Thank you once again for being with me today. I hope you enjoy the week ahead. And the weather, particularly. Above all, take a pause, watch the falling leaves. Um, it's quite a beautiful season here in Maine, of course. Thanks again. Take care. Goodbye.